From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar speaking, Lieutenant Garcia's office. Johnny, you're the one I was trying to reach. This is Carla Monte. Oh, I was going to phone you later. What's happening? Have they found Eddie yet? Not yet, but the police picked up one of his friends, Mario Santores. Oh, Mario, I know him. Well, he's been to the apartment lots of times. Was he in on the robbery? Yes, he just made a statement admitting it. And what did he say about my brother? He says Eddie is the one who planned the whole thing. He must be lying. No, Garcia and I are pretty sure he's telling the truth. I'm sorry, Carla. I'm coming down to headquarters, Johnny. There's no use. There's nothing you can do here. But at least I can be there when they bring him in or whatever happens. It won't help. You're better off at home. Now, no, please. John. I raised him. Some of the fault must be mine. I can't desert him. I'm going to be there if he needs me. <sighs> okay, Carla. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To the Home Office Moto Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account, final page. $100,000 worth of fur coats, silver blue minks, stolen in a warehouse robbery and still missing. A night watchman slugged during the robbery by one of the teenage gang, still lying in a coma, unable to speak. And Red Weller, a man who tried to speak, lay in the county morgue, stabbed to death in a dark alley. But now one of the gang had been arrested, a 17-year-old named Mario Santores, and he'd finally talked. Sitting in Garcia's office, I read Mario's statement through for the second time. Well, what do you think, Johnny? I think the kid was telling the truth. Eddie Monty scraped up enough money to buy that second-hand panel truck and then talked the other kids into knocking over the warehouse. That ties in with what Eddie's sister said. That he'd kept the truck a secret, hadn't told her about it. And also the fact that Eddie seems to be a born leader type. They even mentioned it in one of his former records of arrest. Yeah, I think we can buy it that Eddie Monte is the leader of the gang. Yeah. All right, they picked their night. They cased the place from Red Weller's lunchroom across the street. And as soon as the prowl car passed, they made their move. They got the watchman, Albert Crisman, to open the door by showing him a fake telegram through the window. That's another thing that checks out Mario's story, Johnny. Mario claims he's the one who showed the telegram. That's right. Crisman kept saying, kid with a mark on his arm. And Mario's got a bad scar on his left wrist. That's what I mean. It checks out. Mario didn't know what Crisman had told us. All right, so they got inside, and then, according to Mario's version, it was Eddie Monty who slugged the watchman. Probably true. Then they jumped the other watchman in the dark and started hauling out the furs, loading them into the truck of Eddie's. They knew they had 45 minutes before the prowl car came back through. By that time, they'd finished and split up, Eddie driving the truck away alone and the others disappearing on foot. Yeah, I think that's about the size of it. And I think Mario's telling the truth when he says neither he nor any of the others know where Eddie planned to hide out the truck. And Red Weller, according to Mario, was murdered by another gang member. What was his name? Chewy Morel. Yeah. Well, if that's true, Eddie Monty is at least clean on the murder charge. If it's true. All you can tag him on is robbery and assault on that watchman. I'm kind of glad of it, Johnny. I feel sorry for that sister of his. So do I. She's a good kid. And she's carrying a real load of guilt. Thinks that she's responsible in some way. Oh, she was only 19 herself when their folks died. How could she be expected to hold him in line? And especially in that district. Yeah. She's on her way down here, by the way. Carla Monte? Yeah, yeah. I tried to talk her out of it. Well, uh, maybe she's as well off hanging around here, though, as she is waiting alone in that apartment. It's a rough deal for her, no matter where she waits. Well, at least we can tell her her brother's not in quite as deep as we... Excuse me. Yes, yeah, sure. Garcia speaking. Good. Well, who's the other one? Yeah, yeah, bring them on in and book them. I'll talk to them later. And now we... What? When? All right. Keep in touch with me. The boys just picked up Chewy Morel and the other two. And leaves just one to go. Yeah, the big one. Eddie Monte. And he's even bigger now, Johnny. What do you mean? That watchman, Eddie Slugged, Albert Crisman. What about him? He just died. So it was a different thing we had to tell Carla when she arrived at headquarters. 
Not that a brother would probably get off on a lesser charge. But instead that an APB was out, that every officer in town had been warned, be on the lookout for Eddie Monty, age 19, armed and dangerous, wanted for murder. Expense account item 15, $12.50, rent on a hired car. One of Garcia's boys was certain that the background appearing in the photograph of Eddie's truck was somewhere in his district, but he couldn't tag the exact spot. So I decided to cruise that area street by street. Carla Monty, Eddie's sister, went along with me. There's an alley off to the right, Johnny. It might be worth a look. Yeah, it runs back toward a lumber yard there. That could be a lumber yard in the background of that photograph. Well, we'll give it a try. This isn't it, Johnny. Sally makes a right angle turn there before it even gets to the lumber yard. Oh, we may as well check it on through. It seems to run clear on down to the railroad yards. Oh, please let us find him. If it's the police, he'll fight. And he'll kill someone else. Be killed himself, maybe. It's out of your hands now, Carl. It's got to work itself out in its own way. And there's nothing much anybody can do to stop it or change it. I know, Johnny. I keep trying to fool myself. All the time, I know. Well, all you can do is hope... Look! That fence ahead of us there, next to the railroad yards. Yeah, that could be the fence in these pictures. It looks the same. And that storage shed there at the right, that's in one of the shots. Yeah. And that pile of oil drums. This is it, Carla. This is where those films were taken. The truck was parked right at the corner of that shed. Well, it looks as though that off chance paid off. I'm scared, Johnny. Now that it's so close, I'm scared. Don't be. By off chance, I meant just finding the place. He may not have come back here since the day those pictures were taken. You don't believe that, and you know it. Look, Carla, that house back at the corner has a phone. There's a wire running in from the pole. Go back there and use it to call Lieutenant Garcia. Give him the location and tell him to hit the radio and have this whole area blocked off. Got it? Yes. Tell him to cover the railroad yard, too. Sew up this whole section tight and tell him to make it fast. Johnny. Yeah. Eddie may be watching us from around here somewhere right this minute. I waited until she'd gone. Then I got out of the car and walked toward the shed and the sagging wooden fence that bordered the railroad yards. It was nearly dark now. The high floodlights had been turned on above the crisscross network of gleaming steel tracks. Shadows play tricks at such a time of evening, and I got sudden movements now and then from the corner of my eyes, but, well, yet nothing really moved. And the only sound was the sound of my own footsteps. I stopped several times and stood watching and listening, but nothing moved. And there was only silence. I reached the door of the long wooden shed and found it padlocked. But looking in through a broken window, I could see the lock didn't matter. The shed was empty and long abandoned. Between it and the fence was a drive leading toward the rear. And behind the shed, in a loading area, I found Eddie's truck. And in the back of it was $100,000 worth of furs. All right, darling. Huh? Get your hands up. Eddie, you're in a rut. That's the first thing you said to me the last time we met. I ought to killed you there in that apartment. Isn't one killing enough? I don't suppose you know it, but Albert Chrisman died this afternoon. I know. I got a radio in the truck there. That's where you've been hiding out all the time? Look, if I wanted to answer questions, I'd go turn myself in. You may be better off in the long run if you do. I'll get... You here alone? No, no, your sister's with me. Oh, for the love... What does she want to do? Watch me get it? Why don't you give me that gun, Eddie? It's only a matter of time. You know that. You don't have a chance. Oh. I figure I got a pretty good chance right here in my head. Chance at what? To break Carla's heart? Smash her into the dirt killer, maybe? Shut up. What more do you want to do to her before you're through? I'm not planning to be through. Oh, that's great. But the police are doing some planning of their own. They gotta find me first. I found you, didn't I? And I ought to kill you right where you're standing. Is that all you gotta think about, Eddie? To kill somebody and go on killing until one of them kills you? Shut up! Let me think. Think about Carla if you want to think about something. Think about the things she's done for you, the years she's worked for you, worried about you. Yeah, that dame was born to worry. Nobody's born to worry. They inherit worries, like you were inherited by her. I didn't ask her to do it. Life didn't give her any choice. But it's too late now to talk about that. It's all over, Eddie. This is the wind-up. Come on, now, give yourself up. You haven't got a chance. Oh, and I would have if I gave myself up? Look, don't you hand me that stuff. The police have got this whole section surrounded. Carla went to call them 20 minutes ago. If I thought you were trying to hand Johnny. me... It, keep your mouth shut. Eddie, you don't have a chance. Johnny, Lieutenant Garcia's here. Be careful, Eddie's here. You dirty... 
I hit the dirt and rolled under the truck and came up on the other side with my gun in my hand. I could hear Eddie running away, but I couldn't tell where he was. Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Eddie went over the fence into the yards. Where are you? Here, the corner of the shed. Come on, let's go after him. He can't get through. I've got men working this way from the other side. Where's Carla? Back there somewhere. Come on, we can get through the fence here. Carla, stay where you are. Don't follow us. There he goes, Johnny. Behind that line of freight cars. All right, come on. He can't get too far that way. There's a train coming. There he goes. He's going to try to beat it. The crazy Eddie! Santa Maria! I don't know, Johnny. There must be better ways to die. Expense account item 16, $300.60. Hotel and miscellaneous in Los Angeles and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $541.25. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Well, I guess Carla made the remarks for me. I don't know, Johnny. Those 80 fur coats, they'll go back into stock now. And they'll be sold to women who wear them to parties and dances and nightclubs. And they'll be happy in them. And they'll never know about Eddie or about me or what happened here tonight. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the matter of the medium, well done. And a seance or two that I think you'll like. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Shawnee Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Edgar Barrier, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Tommy Cook, and Richard Crenna. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.